So when does diagenesis stop in the subsurface? Well, because diagenesis is in carbonate driven by aqueous solution, it stops when we no longer have water. And here's some data from my PhD student, um, Ki Adlan, that looked at the clumped isotope temperature of a subsurface reservoir in the Middle East and has shown that recrystallization stopped at a temperature of roughly 92 degrees. Now, if you put this into a known burial history for the region, that places us at roughly 50 million years, so somewhere in the Eocene. And in the Eocene is also when the, uh, the oil was in place in that reservoir. So here we have a beautiful example of an evidence due to carbonate recrystallization that the emplacement of oil completely stopped recrystallization and carbonate, essentially stopped diagenesis. So we really need to understand the interplay between uh, organic compound, oil and gas, and the rocks to fully understand processes that happen in the subsurface. So this relationship between carbon, carbonate, and fluid leads me to define the BSR and TSR. So BSR are bacterial sulfate reduction and TSR are thermochemical sulfate reduction. And in both cases, we're generating new fluids that are more aggressive than the existing or pre-existing conate waters. So let's look at the uh, plot here. So we have temperature and vitrinate reflectance on the vertical axis. Remember that vitrinate reflectance is a proxy for burial temperature. And as it increases with depth, we have an increase in temperature. So bacterial sulfate reduction is limited to relatively low temperature where the bacteria grow. So that's roughly zero to 80 degree, maybe 100 degree, but not much more. And what happens is the biodegradation of the sulfate gives rise to chemical species such as H2S, CO2, and methane. And of course, these play a big role because methane will impact the, uh, the pH of the solution and the carbon isotope of the cement that could precipitate. But H2S is an ex extremely aggressive acid that can dissolve uh, um, carbonate and CO2 as well. And when we go into the realm of TSR, so that's between 100 to 140 degrees Celsius, some studies suggest up to 160 to 180 degrees Celsius, then we have something quite similar because essentially what happened is we have the formation of oil and that oil gives also uh, different hydrocarbon gas, including methane and CO2. And these species can then interact with the sulfate to liberate H2S, and that will basically generate a, a host of different transformation that can change drastically the porosity and permeability of the rock and lead to the deposition of new mineral phases. So here's an example of the Hoof Reservoir in the United Arab Emirates. This was published in 1996 by Richard Warden et al. And I'll show you the different steps of this um, TSR process. So first, we have dissolution of anhydride and dissolution of methane in the burial regime. So at these temperatures of 100 to 140 degrees. That leads to transport of aqueous sulfate or the transport of aqueous methane. And then when, once these two species meet, we have TSR formation or the chemical reaction that leads to the thermochemical reduction of sulfate. And the net effect is that we are now transporting bicarbonate ions in an aqueous solution because we have dissolved the limestone thanks to the TSR process. And further down in this uh, setting, we can then have precipitation of calcite or also uh, possible but more rare, dolomite. So what happens when you have a dolomite or limestone reservoir in contact with an anhydride seal and you bury this to temperatures of 100 to 140 degrees? Well, a lot of reaction can happen as 
suggested by this paper that looked at the, the um, chemical modeling of the processes happening in this setting. But the point I want to make is that you have sulfate here that can interact with methane and that leads to the formation of CO2 which then brings you some carbonic acid and H2S and of course that leads to the dissolution and potential precipitation of calcium carbonate so essentially to TSR precipitation. Some so let's look at some examples of TSR at the outcrop. This is a wadi you're familiar with. We went there together a few uh, classes ago. This is Wadi Galila in the UAE. And there in the Jurassic, we found those beautiful nodule that look like gypsum nodule. They're classic gypsum nodule for this type of deposit, except that they're not gypsum no nodules. They're actually calcite nodules. And these calcite nodules have a very low delta C13 and we are um, certain that they represent the product of TSR. Here's another example of a somewhat larger VUG. And you can see in this VUG two color, a white color, that's calcite, and a more brownish color, that's actually dolomite, that we think is associated with TSR in this particular setting. So here's a close-up look of this. And we even have cases where we find large cavities and these large cavities have inside them this honeycomb structure, which is dolomitic. And so we are um, looking here at the potential for TSR to both precipitate cement, so lose permeability and porosity, but also potentially create a lot of porosity in the subsurface because we have seen many ways to lose porosity with subsurface diagenesis. We compact the rock, we have pressure solution that leads to less matrix porosity, but here's a way, TSR, that potentially can improve porosity and permeability and, by extension, uh, the reservoir characteristics of your rock. So that leads me to my conclusions. We have seen that during burial, we have an increase in temperature and in pressure, and that this leads mostly to a loss in porosity and permeability. However, we've also seen that we have different fluids. So we have brines, but we can also have hydrocarbon that are mixed with those brines. So the impact of diagenesis is proportional to the type of fluids that we have. Because we are in the deep subsurface, to have any extensive diagenesis, we need to move the fluids, we need a pump, for fluid circulation. So it's absolutely essential to understand how at the scale of a basin, these fluids can move. In fractures, we can have multiple episodes of flow. And we've seen an example behind me here in Oman, where we have early fractures, early karstification, followed by collapse of the cave, and then late stage fluid circulating through that karst and leading to the deposition of an iron-rich dolomite. And we've also talked that as we bury those rocks to higher temperature, we can have bacterial sulfate reduction and more importantly, thermochemical sulfate reduction and that this can lead to important reservoir modification, potentially improving reservoir quality along fractures, but also potentially leading to the deposition of a cement. So that's it for this class and that's also the final word for this course and thank you very much for listening to me all that time.
Bye. Bye.